is changing rapidly. The amount of information produced by and available to citizens of this planet has really never been greater than ever before. While many industries have really been open to adapt this technological change, we've really seen uh, a, a slowness to do so in medicine. And so that's really gotten me thinking. I want to talk about this today, this resistance, my experience that I've had in this area, and then at the same time address some of the, the reasons why I think that medicine has been relatively slow to adopt to the, these changes. So I'm not on, pay, I'm not on call right now. <laughs> I just wanted to point to an interesting thing. Dante, Dr. Dante Mora uh, addressed this issue and brought it up and said, you know, if you look at the 1990s, doctors and drug dealers were the only people to use these things. <laughs> now it's just doctors. Drug dealers have moved on. <laughs> I'm a resident in plastic and reconstructive surgery in Calgary, and I'm currently on a leave of absence from my residency program to complete an MBA and run a medical tech startup that I co-founded called Orpix. My reasons to put a, an otherwise very directional career on, on hold was um, multifactorial. Firstly, I realized that clinically there are a number of issues that we tend to really address in a very reactive backseat way. This, is, this has become so much the case now that at, for the first time in human history, we're at a point in time where the burden of chronic diseases such as heart attacks, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes are pouring are posing more of a burden to the healthcare system than our infectious diseases. This is a huge inflection point in time. And along with that increase in chronic diseases, we've seen a larger volume and increase in disease-related complications that not only threaten the, the viability of our healthcare system, but also, also of the quality of life of the patients within that system. And so that really got me thinking. Every 30 minutes, a limb is lost due to a landmine, and every 30 seconds, a limb is lost due to diabetes. This epidemic has gotten so huge now that in North America alone, up to one in three patients are now either diabetic or pre-diabetic. The huge reality of this is that there are a number of complications that come with the disease. Up to 60% of diabetics who, uh, over the course of their, their disease, will develop a, a complication known as peripheral neuropathy, or numb feet. In the US and Canada alone, this equates to over 21.6 million people. That's more than the entire population of New York State that are affected by this. The inability to properly feel a feet is a huge problem. These patients, without knowing it, actually do damage to the feet. They can wear holes in their feet without having that normal pain feedback. And so they develop holes, or ulcers, that can then secondarily become infected. Because a lot of these patients have, a, have underlying poor vascular disease, these wounds can be very difficult to heal. They can be so difficult to heal that one in five of these ulcers will ultimately require surgical amputation. And after patients undergone amputation, the rate of dying within the next five years doubles. So how do we currently treat this problem? Uh, we treat it with providing patients with information about how to control their blood glucose, education about the problem, and proper footwear. But still, the majority of treatment really enters in on the back end and comes in the form of reactive care and surgical intervention for developed complications. Early in my residency, I conceptualized a system to help restore feeling to the numb diabetic foot. In order to take this idea from concept to a tangible product, I co-founded a company called Orpix. This device really draws on the brain's innate ability to readapt or rewire itself that we call neuroplasticity. Using this device, the hope is that patients who have peripheral neuropathy or loss of sensation in the feet would be able to feel their feet again, but in a modified way. Other so-called sensory substitution systems have been developed, and pictured here is something called the brain port, which is a device that's been developed by other scientists for pa patients who have lost their vision and are blind. This restores that vision in a substitute way. So visual information is taken in through a camera affixed to a set of glasses, and then that information is rerouted to an electrotactile grid that's worn on the tongue. So the patient in real time actually sees through his or her tongue. What's really interesting about this is that this, this sensory integration just happens over time and we start to see that with M MRI data, these patients actually rewire their brains. So they actually start to use the part of their brain that's normally used to process vision in order to feel what they're feeling on their tongue. So our system it draws on the same concept, and what it does is it restores feeling to the foot by rerouting that to the back. 
So pressure sensitive insole is slipped inside the shoe and that insole takes a, a force map from the bottom of the foot and then in real time wirelessly relays that to this tactile pad that's worn on the back so the patient can feel their feet through their back. Just like the brain port, the goal is that with time the sensory integration becomes second nature and that it has, doesn't even have to be thought about, that, that in a sense these patients have actually rewired their brains. Other applications for a system like this would be in rehabilitation in patients, for example, who have already undergone amputation and need to restore that sensation to, for example, help them prevent from, from falls or other complications or complications in the, in the leg that they haven't had amp amputated. These complications, ulcers, amputation, infection, ultimately cost the healthcare system about $30 billion a year. So I want to focus now on how at Orpix we're taking a bit of a unique approach to medical technical in innovation. At Orpix we're, we're actively engaging in a technology revolution that has in many ways really skirted medicine, but it really now typifies other aspects of consumer life. In an era where the, the ability to compute on a personal level is so large, we have an opportunity where we can actually now take a lot of ownership of that data that reflects our own health status. And we feel that this democratization of data finds its, its ultimate expression in a system like ours. You can collect all the data that you want, but oftentimes that, that data actually means nothing to the patient on a, on a real level. With a sensory substitution, you're offered the possibility that that data can be incorporated into behavioral change on a real-time basis. So medicine's been uh, relatively resistant to a, a technological revolution for a number of reasons. And I think one of those reasons is, is the fact that the traditional paths to research within medicine are, are quite well entrenched. And over time, we found that grant cycles tend to be slow in the research setting, and that really limits the, the pace of change that you can see within those set settings. And then beyond that, medical research as a part of an institution has really not delved as much as it can in the world of technology and of innovation. At Orpix, we're functioning independently of the university, and we're funding the company on private placement. In doing this in this modified way, we've been able to go from uh, prototype, or sorry, concept to prototype completion in less than two years. So apart from this, why are we doing this in a non-traditional way? I think that in the way that we're doing this, we're able to uh, really navigate some of those hurdles within the healthcare system or some of those cultural barriers that really do limit innovation at its very roots. So one of the problems is exactly that. There's, there's not enough of a culture of innovation within medicine. Sir Ken Robinson says, as children grow up, we tend to educate them progressively from their waist up, and then we focus on their heads and slightly to one side. <laughs> He's referring to the tendency of us to foster left brain growth at the expense of creativity and innovation, and medical education is really no exception here. We've come a long way in systematically embracing the scientific method and evidence-based medicine. But that really doesn't mean we have to leave creativity by the wayside or deny us ourselves of the mechanisms of change that have really entered into other areas of consumer life. We select for medical students who have jumped through the same proverbial hoops to get into medical school and have checked off those same boxes on their medical school applications. We really don't foster creative thinking. In medical school, we're taught about the art of medicine, which refers to one's bedside manner, and we don't have any discussion of innovation that enters into that mix. The other big problem is the lack of a culture of commercialization. And I think universities themselves may be in part responsible for this. The typical university intellectual property policy is one in which any intellectual property developed out of a university uh, is owned in uh, oftentimes a large part by the university itself. They claim a stake over that intellectual property. And in many cases, that's actually hampered the success of, success of businesses that can spin out of universities. Some institutions have taken a different approach to IP and in doing so have really become true innovation hubs such as the University of Waterloo. There, or researchers own their own ideas. They're encouraged to start up companies, to put, they, they're given resources to put into IP development and in fostering researchers in the, this way, the hope is that with time these people will actually give back to the university but not by necessity. And they've really found that the model works. 
Well, we know that the majority of companies are not spun out of university ideas and that intellectual property policy doesn't necessarily, necessarily dictate what a university will produce. It definitely does impact the type of people that it draws and will draw more entrepreneurially minded individuals. Another big problem is strained human resources. The typical resident physician works 80 to 100 hours per week. Uh, US, uh, the one US study looked at incorporating aviation industry standards into the healthcare system in order to lighten this load. They found that it would cost the system about six and a half billion dollars a year and require a 147 percent increase in the number of residents to meet that deficit. So in working over double full time and with no cost effective solution to amend this, it seems that it's almost next to impossible to have people innovating the system who know it best. We know disease, we know treatment, we know prevention, we know the system, and, and in a lot of ways we can see what's wrong from, with that system firsthand. But we don't have any time to fix it. Some of our brightest and most creative minds are stuck in this system just seeing that its inefficiencies are moving forward and churning that over. But maybe we can turn this around. Modern day medical students and research, or residents are the first digital native physicians. As kids, we were processed, we played turtle draw, we lived vicariously through Mario and Luigi, we ushered in the internet, and we were the first people to sign up for Hotmail accounts. <laughs> so maybe, maybe this new generation can really affect that change that needs to happen. I believe that uh, healthcare IT innovation and commercialization should be a valid alternative to the traditional research route within medicine. And I think it's something that we'll almost in, and certainly have to foster if we expect to usher in this new era of technology that we expect to see in medicine. Most North American residency programs mandate resident-driven research. Multiple programs have been set up so that the, the, these residents can actually take on traditional graduate studies such as Masters of Science or PhDs. And in doing so, they actually are given salaried support over that time so that they can continue to pursue their research interests. No such programs exist for residents who want to take on advanced education in innovation or in master's business administration. So maybe, maybe this is something, this era of change, something that we as the, the new healthcare professionals can usher in, or maybe we'll have to wait until the consumers demand it and catalyze it themselves. I want to leave you with a challenge. Take ownership of the data involved in your medical care. Find ways to leverage technology to get you and your healthcare providers the information that you need to get a more, uh, more complete picture of your health. If your cell phone can run a map program that can simultaneously talk to multiple satellite systems in order to get, to get you here today, then I think we really have a duty to expect that that same cell phone can navigate our, and help us to navigate our own healthcare da data with the same fluency. Thanks. <laughs>